hello, welcome. Hello, let me just make sure the audio is working. Welcome, this is the global community for adult survivors of complex trauma. Adults who are living with the after effects of adverse childhood experiences, ongoing interpersonal repeated relational trauma, usually beginning in childhood, sometimes going on for decades. And now in your present day life, you're living with what you believe to be CPTSD symptoms. You can um, easily type in CPTSD to your favorite search engine and it will pull up a defi definition. There's also a foundation that we started, cptsdfoundation.org. Um, you can also type in developmental trauma disorder or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and you'll kind of go down a rabbit hole. There's tons of videos. There's a lot of people on YouTube that that talk about complex relational trauma, particularly uh, in the United States, because in a lot of other countries, complex post-traumatic stress disorder is acknowledged as a diagnostic um, element with a standalone DX code, or um, it meets diagnostic criteria uh, in the mental health space in other countries, but not here in the United States. Um, and uh, for for the, the reasons behind that are, are myriad, but one of the reasons is other countries use what's called the international classification of diseases, 11th edition, also known as the ICD-11, which is published by the World Health Organization. And in the United States, we use what is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5th edition, also known as the DSM-5. And um, so there lies the divide. <laughs> so those of us who are living in the United States and are living with symptoms that we believe to be what we find on the internet under CPTSD. Um, we sometimes are scouring the internet for uh, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and even years. And um, when we get the, the courage to print out, when our many community members tell me they get the, they get the courage to finally print out the piece of paper that they find, uh, that describes exactly what it is that they are um, going through and then their printer won't work and uh, they're out of toner cartridge or something's going on and so then they they send it to a local printer and then you know they they get to the local printer they get the piece of paper they're just terrified to talk to their therapist about it and then they're just in tears because they're like they can't believe they finally found what it is that they're, they've been going through and it's staring at them on their phone or their computer and they've printed it out on this paper and they're just crying tears of of joy and sadness and and anticipation and anxiety and hopefulness and all these things just mixed together and then they get in front of their therapist here in the United States and they say I think I found what it is that I've been going through I think that this is what I'm living with, this CPTSD and their therapist who may not be trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive um, says, well, that doesn't exist. And so all of a sudden, the invalidation and the, the hopelessness and the helplessness and the sadness and the anxiety and the depression and the post-traumatic stress and all the things that we were crumbling under for for weeks, months, and years, it all just sort of comes rushing back to the surface again as we feel deflated. <laughs> so that sort of describes what happens in our community. And that's why we started a foundation uh, to raise awareness around the topic of complex relational trauma, ongoing repeated relational trauma. And we have CPTSD Awareness Day. The first one was last year uh, in 2020. 
We have our second annual CPTSD Awareness Day coming up September 2nd and September 2nd every year, but this year, 2021, September 2nd, um, we do have an Awareness Day Summit and we talk a lot on this channel about what is CPTSD, uh, what's been working, what, what hasn't been working, um, how are we managing our symptoms and everything we share on this channel um, as it's been, we've all been sort of showing up here every week, almost every week for almost seven years now, over six years. And um, it's always been from a lived experience perspective. And um, I say that because I really feel like it's important for me to, to bring that home um, for those who are newer to our community. Um, let me go here and show you why. Warm welcome to, to those of you who are here for the live discussion. Um, I just want to pause and say hello. Warm welcome to John Harvey and VQ, Ninja Taco, Tara, Carrie, Shannon, Poppy. Thank you so much to Poppy and my Blue Wrench crew. All the people you see in the, in the chat box with a little Blue Wrench next to their names. I couldn't do any of this without them. A warm welcome to Belinda. Uh, our Blue Wrench crew shows up here week after week after week for years now, just making sure that the chat box stays a safe enough place for complex trauma survivors to come and hang out and just ask questions and hang out with others who have been down the, the same path and have um, unfortunately um, it's been struggling as a result of complex relational trauma. So warm welcome to Erica G. Erica G says, I'm new here. Hello. I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you for spending a little bit of time with us. This is so wonderful. Hello to Miss Shannon. Hello. Oh, I'm so glad to see all you. Hey, Sharon. Great to see you. Hello. <laughs> oh. It's so great. So there's a whole bunch of crisis resources. Hey, Bliss Bliss. So good to see you. Um, so uh, there's a ton of crisis information, crisis contact information in the chat box right now. This is this uh, this weekly discussion that we have is never a place for crisis care. Um, this is just YouTube. And so it's great for informational purposes and hanging out and uh, meeting others who, who may have uh, a deeper understanding or a similar understanding to the topics that we discuss on this channel. Um, but I really just want to make sure you know that there are resources available out there on the topic of CPTSD and you can go to cptsdfoundation.org anytime we have a free a newsletter. We have a free Facebook community. Uh, we also have uh, a whole bunch of other no cost resources. And we also have some low cost resources like a healing book club. Um, we have a, we have a blog with hundreds of articles um, and that's free. We have a weekly newsletter that's free we have a safe support group on facebook that's free and then the ones that are low cost are the daily recovery support calls the healing book club uh, we have a mindfulness prayer and meditation circle that happens uh, periodically that's starting back up again in april um, it's just a wonderful uh, place to hang out so i'm super glad to have you we're going to talk today about intergenerational trauma. We're going to talk about separating from family issues. And we're going to talk about some different ways that intergenerational trauma can be passed down generationally. Hence the name intergenerational trauma. Can CPTSD be passed down? Hey, Nance, so glad to see you. So can CPTSD be passed down generationally? Yes, it can. Let me describe for you a couple of ways why or how. So uh, repeated relational trauma is something that is a learned behavior. It's not something that's innate. Um, we are not born knowing how 
to repeatedly harm others uh, over and over, over a long period of time. That's not something we come out of the womb with a desire to do. Uh, that would be a survival mechanism. It would be something that would be a learned behavior. And sometimes the behaviors and the lifestyles that we learn are those that we take with us into our future relationships unless we have the wherewithal or the sense, the common sense, the, the means, um, the mindset, the will, the desire to change that behavior. Hey, Jeffrey Sherman, so good to see you. It's so great to be here with all of you. So, so complex post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, a series of symptoms. It's a, it's a construct that is not recognized in the United States, is recognized in other countries, and it is what happens as a result of repeated relational trauma, ongoing repeated abuse or neglect or dysfunction that goes on for a long period of time, always involves another person. You're in a one down position down here. The other person is up there. You're unable to get away from that other person. And there is typically an abuse of power and usually... This involves a loss of safety or a betrayal of some sort. This is someone you should have been able to trust. And there is a betrayal of that trust. And you should be able in this situation to be safe. But unfortunately, you are in circumstances where you are unsafe. And so that, what I just described... If someone doesn't have the wherewithal or the desire to change that pattern, they will pass it down to future generations. And the single solitary mission of the foundation we started is to leave a legacy of healing for future generations. And that is what you all are here for. There are over 20 of you here live right now in this discussion, 23, 24 of you having a, a discussion right now, you're here to hang out with others. Um, there are thousands of you that are on this YouTube channel and you are interested in learning about how to leave a legacy of healing for future generations. You are looking to heal. You are looking to break that cycle. Great to see you, Martha. Hello to anyone else I have not greeted by name. I believe I've... Hello to Sandra. Wonderful to see you. So there are lots of books on healing intergenerational trauma. Um, one of them is called Childhood Disrupted. Another one is called It Didn't Start With You. There's one called The Deepest Well, written by Nadine Burke Harris. Um, there are... There's another one written by Janina Fisher. I can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, we're going to have a discussion tonight about ways that we can, since we are here on this channel and you can hear my voice, you are interested in leaving a legacy of healing for future generations or you're interested in healing regardless of future generations. You have some healing to do. And since that happens to be the case, we're going to talk about how to separate ourselves from um, any type of intergenerational trauma that we have experienced. How can we separate ourselves from trauma that we experience in the home we grew up in or in the loved ones that we are surrounded by? Um, know that Melody Beatty is uh, one of my favorites. I've been reading a lot of her lately. It's been life-changing for me to uh, to learn about. I mean, it's just mind-blowing that here she is. Uh, her book that I'm reading right now was written during one of the deepest parts, deepest, most painful times of my life 
when a lot of my abuse was happening. And it's as though it was written directly to me. Um, and then, so I'm going to read to you tonight, uh, in just a few moments, from Melody Beatty. But first, I want to pause. And I want to um, show you a message that was sent in that sparked this conversation. And this was sent in by one of you. Hi, I was wondering if we could do a daily recovery support call sometime about intergenerational trauma. I know it is present in specific and general ways on both sides of my family. It's been helpful to put some of my experiences in context. I think we would benefit from learning more about it and discussing it as a community. Uh, this was sent in by Cassie. She gave me permission to use her name. And we did cover this topic uh, last Wednesday on our daily recovery support call. And I really just wanted to invite the greater community to participate in this discussion um, because this really is such a deep, 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 deep topic that requires um, a lot of time, a lot of grace, a lot of space, and a lot of compassion. And I just wanted any of you out there to know that if your relational trauma, your repeated relational trauma, began in your family, healing is possible. You're here every week and you have been for several years, some of you, uh, almost seven years now, and we are healing. We are healing trauma. We are healing trauma. And I'm hoping that you are able to feel that in your body and just pause and breathe that in the truth that we are healing trauma and I'm not sure how familiar you are with with neuroscience neurobiology neurophysiology um, neuroplasticity brain plasticity basically New brain scans over the past several years have shown that the human brain is malleable. And what that means is that we, neuroplasticity says, neuroplasticity is what gives this community hope. Because what it says is, if you've learned it, if it was taught to you or passed down to you, you can unlearn it. Your brain can learn and create new neural pathways every single day this, on this earth while you're breathing oxygen. If you still have a heartbeat, your brain is still malleable and it can learn new things and it can unlearn old things. And that is a tremendous reason to celebrate. If you are a part of this community, you know how painful it is to experience repeated relational trauma and you know the devastating effects of repeated relational trauma you know that some of it is passed down within your family you know that intergenerational trauma is present um, on one or both sides of your family you know that you've had relational experiences within the context of your family of origin that are painful or you wish they were different. And you're here, I believe, on purpose, for a purpose, because you know or you hope that you are going to be able to benefit from learning more about healing topics and just by having these open discussions in a community where you can experience safety, 
where you are able to show up here week after week and feel seen and heard within the context of safety. That in and of itself helps to create new neural pathways. You're already learning a new way of living, a new way of existing, a new way of healing. And it takes a lot of courage to do that, to show up moment by moment, hour after hour, day by day, week by week, month after month, year after year. It takes a lot of courage to heal what it is that you have been through if you're here on this channel. So thank you to Cassie for prompting this open discussion that we've had now a couple of times. And, um, oh, I forgot to tell you guys, um, thank you so much, Cassie. Thank you. Um, I forgot to tell you guys, I did get this, um, you know, occasionally I get these nasty grams. Um, I get these nasty grams. I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you all about it later. Um, for right now, let's just continue with the discussion that we're having. And then after we get done discussing about separating from family issues, um, I want to point out what the, our channel is versus what it isn't. And um, that way we can help um, manage the expectations that people have when they come to our channel. So um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in, in, uh, in about 10 minutes after we, after we read. So Melody Beatty, um, like I was saying earlier, um, her reading and her, her writing rather gives me a lot of hope, um, because, um, you know, this book I'm reading of, of hers right now, she wrote it during one of the most traumatizing seasons of my life. And here I am, um, I'm reading, I'm reading this 30 years later, uh, more than 30 years later, I think. I don't remember the exact date this was published now, but I remember thinking, oh my goodness, this is like right around that really difficult, painful time in my life. Let me see when it was. Um, I, don't, I don't have the date now. I thought I had it. Let me see. It's right here. Yeah. It's about 30, 31 years later. This was written in 1990. Um, such a painful time in my life. Such a devastatingly painful time in my life. Um, very traumatizing. Lots of complex trauma. Repeated relational trauma. Ongoing repeated relational trauma. Both inside my family of origin and out. Um... And I know many of you have sent in emails and stories and thank you for understanding. I can't respond to every single one of them personally. I just, I, I am unable to reply to everyone's emails personally. It is just the influx of communication written and otherwise is, um, on the topic of healing and just the, the deep needs of information is just overwhelming. Um, so thank you for understanding that I'm, I'm receiving all of your communication. I'm just unable to reply personally, but Melody here, um, she writes in this book that has been distributed, I mean, to hundreds of thousands of people, but it feels like she was saying it directly to me, um, truly just inspired, right? So she says, uh, and this is for each of you, I believe. Let me just check on you real quick over in the chat box. Hello to Stephanie and Lou and Nancy. So great to see everyone. Hello to Van. Hello to P. Randall. I think I got a chance to greet every single one of you. Hey, B. Great to see you. Warm welcome to every single one of you. It's so great to have you. Hey, Angela. 
Hmm. Wonderful, wonderful to see you. Hello, warrior. Hello. <laughs> uh, okay, so. So Melody says, and she's speaking directly to my heart, and I hope this reaches you in a way that feels supportive and helpful. Um, really just such a blessing. She says to me, as I'm reading this, I feel like she, she says my name. Athena, we can draw a healthy line, a healthy boundary between ourselves and our nuclear family. We can separate ourselves from their issues. Some of us may have family members who are addicted to alcohol and other drugs and who are not in recovery from their addiction. Some of us may have family members who have unresolved codependency issues. Family members may be addicted to misery, pain, suffering, martyrdom, and victimization. We may have family members who have unresolved abuse issues or unresolved family of origin issues. We may have family members who are addicted to work, eating, or sex. Our family may be completely enmeshed, or we may have a disconnected family in which the members have little contact. We may be like our family. We may love our family. But we are separate human beings with individual rights and issues. One of our primary rights is to begin feeling better and recovering, whether or not others in the family choose to do the same. We do not have to feel guilty about finding happiness and a life that works. And we do not have to take on our family's issues as our own to be loyal and to show we love them. Often, when we begin taking care of ourselves, family members will reverberate with overt and covert attempts to pull us back in to the old system and roles. We do not have to go. I feel like she says, we do not have to go, Athena. We do not have to go. Their attempts to pull us back are their issues, Athena. Taking care of ourselves and becoming healthy and happy does not mean we do not love them. It means we're addressing our issues. It means we are addressing our issues. We do not have to judge them because they have issues, nor do we have to allow them to do anything they would like us to just because they are family. We do not, here, let me read that one over again. We do not have to judge them because they have issues, nor do we have to allow them to do anything they would like to us just because they are family. We are free now, free to take care of ourselves with family members. Our freedom starts when we stop denying their issues and politely but assertively hand their stuff back to them where it belongs and deal with our own issues. Today I will separate myself from family members. I am a separate human being even though I belong to a unit called a family. I have a right to my own issues and growth. My family members have a right to their issues and a right to choose where and when they will deal with these issues. I can learn to detach in love from my family members and their issues. I am willing to work through all necessary feelings in order to accomplish this. <sighs> yeah. Hmm. Oh, you all. It's just so healing. 
I'm like, I picture Melody and all of her just, her lovely self with her big, big, big smile and her warmth. And I picture her writing this back when I was a 16 year old and in so, 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 so much trauma, so much pain. So much abuse, neglect, and dysfunction going on around me. And she wrote this. And here I am reading it. I feel like that is like a small miracle. Right? Deep tears of joy right now in freedom. I am free. I am free. We are healing trauma. Mm. <sighs> Let me get my glasses back on. Let me check on you all. Hello to Amy Lee. Hello to Josiah. Warm welcome to those who I have not greeted by name. I think I got to say hi to each of you. Oh, Sandra, Sandra says, what book and page, please? Thank you for asking. That would be Melody Beatty, Language of Letting Go, pages four and five. It was from about a month and a half ago, and I've been wanting to talk about this topic, and then sure enough, it kept niggling at me, and then Cassie sent in the email about intergenerational trauma, and I just thought, you know what, we're going to go for it. We're going to go for it, you know? Yes, Poppy, freedom. We are free. We are free to choose. I want to talk about a couple of things that are not often talked about under the umbrella um, of intergenerational trauma and how trauma is passed down through the generations. How complex post-traumatic stress disorder can be passed down in families okay so there are there are many but i'm going to i'm going to highlight two of those areas right now one is parentification and the other is infantilization and then another the third one, which we'll talk about next week, is covert incest, also known as emotional incest, um, where the adult depends on and treats the children in the family as though they are adults and depends on the children in the family to meet her or his emotional needs as an adult would. Um, it's very covert. Uh, it's not anything that uh, necessarily involves uh, the physicality of an adult relationship, but emotional needs still take a toll on the children of the family. And emotional incest or covert incest is a really, really, really big topic that I believe needs to be covered in its own discussion because um, the effects on children who grow up to be adults um, can uh, can last a lifetime and require deep healing. So, um, but first, uh, for today, we are going to be talking about, um, for the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to talk about parentification and infantilization. And I'm going to go off on a bit of a rant here. Uh, many of you have been here on this channel with us um, and have been hanging out 
with me sort of every week for, you know, five, six, almost seven years now. And so you're used to my rants. For some of you, uh, when people raise their voice or get really animated, it can be a trigger. So I just wanted to let you know ahead of time, like, I'm, I get, uh, I get pretty fired up when I talk about parentification and infantilization, especially because they are two sides of the same coin. All they basically are is, uh, the, the parent or the primary object, the primary caregiver stunting the growth of the child. Um, and that is what it is. They're, they're stunting the growth of the child. So I'm going to go off a little bit right now. Um, my mama bear claws are poised and, uh, I was discussing this exact topic with a client and just, I mean, it was like, I, I can't not share this with you all. Um, the parentification and infantilization, double-edged, sort of like two sides of the same coin type of a thing, and just the gaslighting and the mind, the mind bending of it all. It is just mind numbingly, mind bending and confusing, and um, and there's just such a lack of consistency, uh, and it's so confusing for the child, and it debilitates. And prohibits the child from emotionally maturing, physically maturing, relationally maturing, um, educationally, relationally, financially, spiritually, um, physically. I'm just in every way, the parent is preventing the child from developing. And that's the goal because in the moments and whether or not the parent knows it, whether or not the primary object knows it, when they parentify and infantilize the child, they are preventing the child from individuating and preventing the child from developing into a healthy, separate entity. And they have one job. When the child is born, when a baby is born, we as parents, we have one job. Don't screw up <laughs> that little perfect baby. <laughs> that little baby just needs to be loved and cared for. It needs safety. That little baby needs safety. That little baby needs to be seen and heard. The little baby needs approval, food, shelter, clothing, protection. It's very simple. And when you parentify and infantilize as a means of control, you prohibit the healthy development in every area of that child's life. So I'm going to back up away from the microphone so that I don't bust out anybody's eardrums. And I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're not familiar with parentification, I'm going to talk about parentification first and I'm going to use an example and then I'm going to talk about the same example in light of infantilization. So let's just say you have, uh, let's just say there's a, a little girl or a little boy, doesn't matter, a child and the child is growing up in this environment where Basically, there is no consistency. There's a lot of responsibility on the child. Let's say the child at this point, let's just pick an age, age five, okay? Let's just pick an age, age five. So if the primary object, if the primary caregiver is involved in parentification of a five-year-old, what this looks like is the adult needing the child to help with adult tasks like doing the dishes, taking out the trash, sweeping the floor, wiping off the dinner table, dusting the coffee table, watering the plants, feeding the dog, taking out the garbage, just doing, doing adult things. Now you, someone could say, but but that's healthy to teach the child responsibility. You want them to do adult things. Ah, yes, you're right. However, when it crosses over 
into parentification versus healthy development, the key here is, is it at the expense of the child's well-being? Is the child getting exasperated? Is the child not developing relationally, physically, mentally, emotionally, or otherwise as a result of taking on the responsibility of the adult? The adult says, go get me a beer from the refrigerator. Go grab mama a soda. Go grab daddy some chips. Okay. And the child runs and goes and gets daddy a beer, gets mommy some soda or, or grabs some chips. But then when the child wants to play with a toy, it's not able to play with the toy because it's time to do chores or it's time to go to bed or it's time to do adult things. Now, As you all know, I've been speaking from a lived experience on this channel for several years now, and today is no different than any of those other days. I specifically remember being very, very, very little. I was actually younger than five, and my father had suffered a near-death motorcycle accident where he almost lost one of his limbs. Uh, Therefore, he was uh, lying on the sofa and he was unable to care for himself. And I had to get a big wine carafe from the kitchen that was glass and bring it to him so that he could urinate in the big glass wine carafe. And when he was done urinating in the big glass wine carafe, I had to go empty the urine and bring back the carafe for when he needed it again. It was my job, that was my job. And it was my job to stand on the the chair and do the dishes. And if I didn't do them right, I would get yelled at and then I broke a glass and then the glass broke around my hand because I didn't know that you can't stick your hands inside wine glasses because they'll, if you stick your hand inside, it can like for some reason the pressure pushing outward on a wine glass will break it versus the pressure on the outside pressing inward. I I didn't understand the whole physics of that or the just the way that that whole thing works with glass. Like, you know, I was four. So um so I got in trouble for breaking glass. I got in I mean, I just I got in trouble. I didn't know how to do all these adult things and it was my job to do all these adult things. I don't have memories of playing with blowing bubbles and, you know, having fun outside and like doing those fun things because I was being the parent, hence the word parentification. The parent is teaching the little child how to be a parent, relying on the child to do parent type things. Okay. So that's it. The only difference between showing a child healthy responsibility and parentification is one question and one question only. Is this happening at the expense of the child's well-being? Clearly, in my case, it was. And in many of the situations that people write into us about, absolutely 100% they are. When the the adults are doing a whole bunch of other adult things and leaving the children outside to pull all the weeds or to muck the horse corrals or to water the plants or vacuum the floor or do all the adult things while the adults are doing maybe fun things or other things and it's clearly at the expense of the child's well-being and there isn't a healthy balance that's parentification so the message the implicit message that is being communicated to the child this entire time can be boiled down to this. It's your job. Be a grown up. It's your job. Learn how to be a grown up. This is your job. Learn how to be a grown up. This is your job. Learn how to be a grown up. This is your job. Learn how to be a grown up. Now, The dichotomy and the paradox of the entire thing is that children love to pretend that they're adults and they're so excited to grow up so that they can move out and move on and and do big adult things. But it's not because they want to do all these parentification uh, tasks that I've described or they can relive, 
you know, all the parent the the parentified moments of their life, and they they just want to grow up and go out there and live their very best parentified life. Like that's not why they want to grow up and move out. They want to grow up and and you know learn how to how to read and write and and do math and drive a car or ride a bike or travel or go to university or make friends or see the world through different eyes and they're not able to hope and dream if they are being parentified this is your job you need to be doing these things for your parents this is why you were born do these things that's parentification okay now the opposite side of the exact same coin is infantilization do all the chores take care of your of your family laying on the couch empty their urine make sure that they're taken care of make sure they're fed make sure you're taking care of all the chores and doing all the adult things ah but oh nope nope don't do that here i'll do that for you oh but i can do this by myself I'm excited to do, to do this by myself. I want to I want to pour my milk on my cereal by myself. My son's very first sentence was I do by myself. I do it. I do it. I do by myself. That was his first sentence. I think one of his first words was also chocolate. Um but <laughs> at any rate, I do by myself. So kids are so excited to do it by themselves. But not at the expense of their own well-being. And so when, when you squash a child's livelihood and hopes and dreams and excitement and enthusiasm by saying, give that to me, it's the adult's job to do that for you. I'll pour the milk on your cereal. No, no, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't open that. Here, give it to me. I'll open that for you. I, I'll never forget being a 30-something-year-old woman and I'm getting ready to open um, a present on Christmas morning. And my dad says, ah, ah, give it to me. I'll do it. And he gets, pulls out his knife from his, from his, uh, his, his waist holster, little leather holster. And he gets his pocket knife out and he, you know, cuts the tape. Of course, I can't say, Dad, don't do that. Like, I want to do it myself. I'm like 30-something years old because then I'm, you know, not being grateful. And I'm not thankful that my dad just wants to help me. But at that point, he's treating me like an infant. Hence the word infantilization. Infantilization is when a child wants to do an age-appropriate task or participate in age-appropriate activities and the parent tells them that they're just not ready to do those things, that, that, they're, that they need help with those things. Here, I'll do that for you. Let me help you with that. It's the mom who insists on washing all of her children's clothes all the way through grade school, middle school, high school, and even university because the mother is so obsessed with knowing what clothes the child is wearing, what smells, what stains, what are there. And, and then for that's usually used as a means of control to humiliate. Oh, I, I see you had your monthly cycle and you ruined another perfectly good pair of pants, usually publicly to humiliate the child who is just an adult, just a, a child trying to learn how to be an adult because she's been told that it's her job to be an adult her whole life. But she's unable to just do her own laundry because the mother insists on doing her own laundry because she's the one who knows how to do it right. And the child will never know how to do, it, do her own laundry. Or the young man who just wants to learn how to work on his own car and change the oil or fix a flat tire and the the dad insists on doing it for him because he needs he needs it done right the car needs to be taken proper care of now these are very 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 
um, heteronormative, traditional gender sort of um, examples that I'm being given, that I'm that I'm giving you right now as a result of our audience that listens and participates in these open discussions being from all over the world where sometimes traditional heteronormative gender roles are something that are honored and they are traditions within their family and it's it's what is their norm so um it can also be a mom who insists that her son not learn how to cook because it's just not something that he needs to learn how to do he's going to grow up and get married and somebody else is going to cook for him but he just wants to learn how to make his own food but the mom insists that he's not supposed to do that he doesn't need to do that i'll do that for you i know just how you like it honey you like the way i make the macaroni and cheese i'll do that for you you like how i I use just the right amount of fabric softener. I'll just do that for you. I know how to open up and and make sure that you don't get a paper cut on the Christmas packages. So I'll just use the knife and, and cut the tape for you so you don't get a paper cut. Do all of my all of my adult things and take care of me and empty my urine jar, but don't open a Christmas package on Christmas morning because I want to do that for you because I'm a good dad. Do you see the mind bending, uh, just confusing gaslighting doesn't make sense. Uh, like, I mean, it truly is what rage it's like a recipe for rage. Like, Wait a second, you're telling me it's my job to find a step stool to make it up onto the dining room chair to wash all of your dishes, but I'm not allowed to make my own lunch for school? So again, usually infantilization is is just a means of control. They need to control you to keep you young, to keep you dependent upon them, because that is the only way they can be sure that you will always, 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 always need them as much as they need you. And that right there, the discussion we just had for the last however many minutes is pretty much a recipe on how to destroy a human soul. Just scoop out the insides, dump them, put in whatever you want, make the kid do whatever you want the kid to do, and any wants or needs or curiosities of their own, well, they got scooped out. You can just replace it with whatever you want them to feel or think. And don't worry, they'll always need you forever and ever. And therefore, you can always depend on them to take care of you when you're old because you taught them how to do that when they were four. Yeah, not okay. Not okay. This is just a small part of what can create symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. This is just a small part of trauma being passed down from generation to generation to generation. And when we're, we're gonna delve deeper into the topic next week when we cover the topic of emotional incest or covert incest. Uh, It's a deep, deep, deep topic. It's basically everything I just described, uh, but like bump it up a few notches because not only are you expected to do all the things for the adults, but you also need to have all the adult discussions and meet all the emotional needs of the parents as though you were an adult. You're their bestie. You're the one that goes goes with them to the office Christmas party. You're the one that attends the function with them. Or you're expected to go shopping with them and do all the things that their friends would do with them or what their spouse would do with them. And not necessarily physical things, but just you're their therapist. You're their emotional support system. You are the ones, you are the one they text 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 times a day because you're their best friend and you're their greatest teacher 
and you're the one they look up to and they're so proud of you. And when that starts, when you're in single digits, like not even 10 years old, and it continues on till the time you're 40, 50, 60 years old, you don't even know that there is anything but that. Like it's something that takes its toll on your developmentally, it takes its toll on you developmentally in every way. Were you able to uh, have an authentic thought or feeling of your own? Did you have a free will choice on what type of spirituality or spiritual practices, religious traditions, faith beliefs? Did you have an authentic thought of your own that you didn't have to run by your parent who was depending on you for all of their needs? Were you able to have friends and loved ones and and flatmates and classmates and um, colleagues that didn't pass daddy's and mommy's approval? Um, I mean, how do you heal from that? right? Were you able to choose your own career or did you go to law school because that's what the family said you needed to do? All these things are part of a greater discussion. And I want to be sure to say that not every person that had these types of themes in their nuclear family are struggling. Not everyone dislikes the themes that I'm talking about. It's just, it's just what it is. It just, it just is. It's not called abuse or dysfunction or neglect or parentification or infantilization or emotional incest. To them, it's just called life. And so please resist the urge of going out and bursting someone's bubble and telling them what it is that they're going through unless they come to you first. It's not our job to heal everyone. It's not our job to put everybody else on a healing path. Every single person in the world has their own right to choose to heal or to seek out the support of a support system should they decide that that's something that they want. We don't need to impose uh, on other people's journey. Like we can all just sit over here on YouTube in our chat box and be like, we're woke. We know what's going on in the world. Like we have a vocabulary now for what all this is. Let's go tell everybody so that they can all heal. But it's not our job. Like that, it's just not our job. I'm having this discussion with you right now because so many of our community members have asked us, to cover this topic. And I would be remiss if I did not express in all honesty how painful this topic has been to sit with and glance at and research. And I just I need you to know that if in your if you are in a tremendous amount of emotional or even physical pain If your life, your relationships, your financial situation, your educational situation, your occupation, your spiritual life, your physical health, every area of your life, if you are struggling right now as a result of all of these topics that we've been talking about, please know that you're not alone. We started a foundation to let people know that they're there is a space to talk about these things and to have these open discussions where they don't need to feel ashamed. You can go to cptsdfoundation.org and um, just know that you're not alone and just know that next week we will be delving deeper into the topic of emotional incest, also known as covert incest. And it is going to be a painful discussion and Um, I just, I want you to know you're not alone. Okay. I really just want you to know that you're not alone. Um, and we care. I want you to feel seen and heard within the context of safety. Okay. That's my, my heart's desire. 
oh, I promised you, <laughs> now that we're at the end, I promised you that I would let you know um, that I got I got a nasty gram. Um, but first, I'll, I'll wait till I'll show it to you at the very, very, very end. <laughs> but first, I just want you guys to know that our uh, our community Facebook group is ready. <laughs> We hung the pictures. We moved in the furniture. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of us over there. Um, it's a it's a place where if you're interested in experiencing safe enough community uh, with others who have gone through repeated, ongoing, repeated relational trauma and are living with CPTSD symptoms, um, we treat one another with mutual respect and kindness and compassion, zero tolerance policy, content warnings. Uh, it's just a great place to connect. So please, you're welcome to join us. It would be so, so, so great. There's a pinned comment at the top of the chat box. There's a link. Um, and either myself or one of my team members or Miss Poppy, one of us will welcome you in and say hello to you. And you'll see a lot of familiar faces if you've been around here for five, six, seven years. And you'll see a lot of new faces as well. And it would be super awesome to have you join us. So um, I hope to see you there. <laughs> but as promised, um, <laughs> I got I got a little nasty gram. Um, it's not the first one I've gotten. I get them all the time. Um, but this person, <laughs> I know you all will understand. Um, <laughs> this person is super, super frustrated because they are not, um, happy with the videos that we have on our channel. And, um, We've talked about this over the years, but I decided to put together uh, a very kind response to every single comment, um, which I will probably share these types of comments with you from time to time. <laughs> because, you know, they're speaking from their pain and... I feel bad that they're not getting their needs met. And so what I did as it's in my own handwriting, this is my handwriting. <laughs> this person says, I have listened to two of your recordings <laughs> and you, you talk about yourself and fluff. You talk more about yourself and fluff than anything else. <laughs> So what I did, what I did, um, is I just decided to, to, I just want this person and all the people out there to know that, um, I do appreciate their honest feedback. Our channel is, and always has been for almost seven years now, videos and recorded live stream open discussions shared from a lived experience perspective. And for their convenience here, right below here, are the names and pictures, the YouTube thumbnails, uh, as it were, uh, uh, avatars, wh whatever, you know what I'm saying, the little pictures that they have on YouTube of some great creators that I recommend who are trauma-informed, interesting, or helpful. Dr. Romani Dervasala, love her. Richard Grannon, you know he's one of my faves. Angie Atkinson, everybody loves Auntie Angie. Lisa Romano, Lisa A. Romano, Breakthrough Life Coach. Katie Morton, always, always a fan favorite. Shahida Arabi, also known as Self Care Haven. Dr. Todd Grande for a more clinical approach, a more um, stoic approach, very analytical very informative, interesting, and helpful. Love him and a lot of our community's favorite, the crappy childhood fairy. So screenshot this for anyone you know who may be dealing with, you know, a lot of stuff um, that may or may not be complex trauma related. And, you know, 
there's a nice little list of people we recommend. Um, but yeah, so it was a little, little humor. I thought I'd just share a little humor. <laughs> Jeffrey Sherman says, don't listen to the haters. Nah, it's all good. It's all good. I don't mind. I'm getting used to it. <laughs> Martha's like, fluff? <laughs> what? <laughs> Martha says, give me more fluff. <laughs> Warrior says, I love hearing about you, Athena. You really relate to my experiences. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Nance says, this is a channel for us to come and feel accepted and comfortable. And so informative. Thank you, Nance. Oh, y'all are so, y'all are so wonderful. Y'all are so kind. <laughs> thank you for being my family. My friendly family of choice. Poppy says, I get nasty grams on our Facebook page on the daily. Sometimes, most of the time, I'm not bothered. Other times, I contemplate, make, contemplate making an anonymous account just to share my thoughts. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. It's okay. You know, this person and everyone who is scouring the internet for something on the topic of CPTSD um, is probably exhausted and hungry and angry and lonely and tired and invalidated. And, you know, I'm just, it's hard. You guys, healing is hard. It's okay. It's okay. You know, love and light, right? Love and light. <laughs> oh, you guys know what that means. It's time for me to email my team. I got to email my team and let them know what we talked about tonight so that we can include it in our free weekly newsletter, Trauma Informed Tuesday. So if you are not receiving it, it's where we announce all the fun, cool things of all the free stuff and all the cool stuff. Um, <laughs> so you can go to cptsdfoundation.org and you can click around. Miss Poppy has a link uh, where you can click and sign up for free. Um, <laughs> Poppy says, beep, beep, bye. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, but it's always great to spend some time with you. Thank you all so much for being in my life and for allowing me to be in your life. And I will see you next week on the topic of covert incest and emotional incest. Um, it'll be a painful topic, super duper painful. Um, but really necessary. It's really necessary for us to talk out loud about these things that have been kept in the dark for so long. Okay. When we talk about stuff that's dark and we bring it out into the light. The shackles of shame fall to the floor and we are no longer bound by all the shame that we have been carrying around that doesn't even belong to us. So we're going to do a little bit of that next week. We're going to drop those shackles of shame and let them fall and we're going to talk out in the open about covert incest, emotional incest, and uh, and how we can heal. Okay? Take good care of yourselves this week. Be kind and gentle with yourself because you're worth it. And I'll see you soon. <laughs>